through 11 this morning as Jesus, uh, these are two Sabbath scenes, two Sabbath scenes here. I just want to talk about this for a little while. Breaking rules for broken lives. Breaking rules for broken lives. Jesus is going to break some rules and some traditions and some regulations in order to get to some broken lives. Breaking rules for broken lives. Well, you ain't excited, I am. Chapter 6, verse 1. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on, to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took uh, and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, uh -huh. and also gave it to those who, those with him. And he said to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath day, you see, it's a change of scenes, but notice he wants, and it's another day, but he's wanting you connect to connect what is happening with this Sabbath, with the next Sabbath. Y'all see that? Okay, good. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man there was there with a right hand whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? to save life or destroy it. And after looking around at them, all he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was strengthened, or his hand was restored. He found strength as he stretched. He found strength as he stretched. He found strength. As he stretched out on the word of God. Verse 11. But they were filled with fury. The word there means they took a vacation from their right mind. They went insane. And discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Breaking rules for broken lives. Can you say that with me? Breaking rules for broken lives. Thank you so much. Jesus in this text is letting us know that he is so concerned about this broken world and about broken people that he will break our traditions and our regulations and our rules and whatever he got to do to get to these broken lives. I'll break through some rules. I'll break through some traditions. I'll break through some stuff that y'all got set up. I'll break through your system so that I can save some folk. Don't Keep that one professor used to tell me, he said, always, Sean, keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. Keep the main thing the main thing. When it comes to ministry, when it comes to service, when it comes to worship, we can get so lost and caught up in details and this and that and the other rules and regulations that the system itself becomes a God and we forget the God of the house. I wish I had witness in here. And we forget the purpose for which he came, which is to save for lost lives matter. Broken lives matter. Jesus will break through some stuff. He'll break through some rules, some regulations, some rituals, as well as some traditions in order to reach some broken, yeah, yeah. Some broken lives. Yeah. Well, I could stop right there, but since y'all don't believe me, I'm going to have to keep on preaching. <laughs> Jesus values, number one, his rights over our regulations. That's the first thing I want to say this morning. Jesus values his rights. He's going to say, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. He values his rights over our regulation. That's the first thing I want to say. Mm -hmm. Jesus values his rights mm -hmm. over our regulation. Right. And the second thing I'm going to say is Jesus values his restoration yeah. over our restrictions. Right. Jesus values his restoration with a hand restored 
over our restriction is the wrong day to do it. Uh, yeah. So can I say it one more time? Yeah. Make sure y'all got it. Okay, one, this is what I want to say, that Jesus values his rights over our regulations. Yeah. And the next thing we see in the text here is Jesus values his restoration, healing broken lives, uh -huh. over our restrictions. Uh -huh. Let's just look at it for a little while. Um, first of all, let me say the same the text says it's on the Sabbath. Everybody say on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Say it three times. One. On the say it again. Holler it out. What is the significance of the Sabbath? For us, many of us have kind of lost that, lost touch with the significance of the Sabbath, and it's just been reduced down to the folks down the street who do it on Saturday and us who do it on Sunday, and we argue about go back and forth, and then we go eat some chicken and forget all about it. But Sabbath is significant. For a Jew, a Sabbath is up there with circumcision. It identifies you with the nation. It's kind of like the folk who view in America the, uh, the flag, the American flag, is it, that sacred or even more. It is a sign, according to Exodus 31, of the covenant. It's the national identity of the people. Sabbath is huge. Let me tell you how huge Sabbath is. Sabbath is so huge that if you were, according to the law, to violate the Sabbath, that is the death penalty. You don't get put in jail. You don't get a slap on the wrist. You know, this is to violate the Sabbath is a penalty of death. Not only is it the national sign, the significance of the Sabbath, it's a national sign and identity. Not only will it give you, uh, you render the death penalty, but also understand that the Sabbath was not just about one day out of the week. But you also had years as it relates to Sabbath. And even the 50th year was, we call it the year of Jubilee. That was the Sabbath of Sabbath. So you would rest not only just a week, but then that year you would rest and not work the whole year. And you would not plow, you would not sow, you would not do anything. And the question becomes how we going to eat. And he would say, trust God to just bring the food up. And everybody's like, yeah, right. <laughs> because it was an act of faith. In order to rest on God's day, you had to trust God to provide. So it was not only just a day out of the week, it was also yearly Sabbath. And the Sabbath was not just rest. Let me just stop right there. Yeah, it was rest. It was relaxation. It was for the purpose of reflecting. It was for the purpose of standing back from your work and sitting back to enjoy the goodness of the Lord. It was that day that you sat back and said, God has shown us. Smile. Are you still woke up in here? Because you get so caught up in the grind of every day, nine to five, nine to five. Keep, keep, do this, do that, pick this up. You can get so caught up in the, in the rituals of life and the things you in that you just get so burdened. And what happens is you become bitter because all you see is work and work and go back and do this. But you have to step back and step back and say, wait a minute, let me, let me stop. And remind myself that all the stuff that I'm enjoying is the Lord's blessing. Because you get so caught up in what you're doing that you forget that God is good. And when you start forgetting that God is good, you will start trusting something or somebody else. He said, rest! And remember and reflect and remind yourself that I'm a good God. Y'all hear what I'm telling y'all? That was the significance of the Sabbath. And remember, I'm the God of creation. Remember, God created work on six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Y'all do understand when God rested that it wasn't like, shoot, I'm so tired, man. It took me a minute to hang that sun out. I ain't. Somebody give me a Corona. I mean, a Budweiser. I mean, some Kool-Aid. Somebody give me something. I'm tired. Y'all do know that ain't what they mean when they say he rested. When he rested, it means that he was, he ceased, listen to me, he ceased, y'all stop looking at him, hey B, how you doing, he said, I'm trying to preach y'all looking at him, he ceased from his labor because he was satisfied with his work. Can I, can I do that one more time, you act like I said something? When I tell you, he ceased from his labor because he was satisfied 
with his word. I'm going to do it one more time and I'm going to put it up in your driveway. What Sabbath was, I ceased from my labor and said that because I'm satisfied with my work. Do you know what Sabbath is for you? It's when you cease from doing your work and you satisfied with what God has done for you. That's why Jesus said, come to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. When you learn to stop ceasing from your work and to be satisfied with my work. Sabbath, national identity, sign of the nation. If you don't do it, death penalty. Not just one day out of the week, but you had years for Sabbath. And the day of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee, the ultimate Sabbath, the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Let me tell you something. It was not just about rest. It was not just about relaxation. It was also about return. It was about release. So if you had become a slave on that 50th year, that Sabbath, you would go back. You would be free from your slavery. If you had gotten lost and dislocated from your home that year on rest, you would return back to your family. So it was not just rest. It was not just relaxation. It was also return. It was release. It was putting things back in their rightful place. Don't go to sleep on me right now because this is definitely got something to do with what's going on in this text with this man with the withered hand whose hand is dislocated and God is going to put it back in working condition. Y'all ain't here. Right. 
and do little things on the Sabbath. You can't prepare food, but they have extra traditions. They have added rules and regulations to try to apply the law. So it's really not the law that they're dealing with. What they're dealing with is their application of the law. You know, like folks would say that a woman can't wear pants to church. Well, the Bible don't say a woman can't wear pants to church. That's your application of a pa of a pa of a passage in Deuteronomy. That ain't what the Bible said. That's what you. Did. Matter of fact, if Jesus were here, he wouldn't wear no pants. He'd be wearing a long skirt. So that's your application. Oh, okay. okay I better stick to back in the first century. Okay. Yeah, you need to look close now. You know what I mean? I just want y'all to understand that there's a difference between what God specifically say and what we add to it. Did you just say amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they come to him talking about uh, why is it lawful? Is it lawful and all that? And basically saying that we have the right to determine how the law is going to be applied. And our rules and our regulations are the standard by which Jesus you need to submit. So instead of Jesus going back and forth with them about this law and that law, he said, let me tell you where the authority lies. Let me tell you about my right. Instead of going back and forth with you about this rabbi said this and this rabbi said that, because that really don't matter, because I don't listen to the voices of rabbis. Matter of fact, the rabbis need to be listening to me. So I ain't gonna deal with that. What I wanna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back somewhere. He said, do y'all remember David? Y'all remember David? By the way, he made some connections with David and there's some steamy rebukes, follow me. There's some steamy rebuke going on under the surface by him connecting himself with David. Jesus said, y'all do remember David, don't you? Have, you see the thing said, have you not read? It's a whole lot in there, have you not read? Because sometimes what happens is the Bible, when you start reading it, you'll discover that it'll start reading you. Ooh, Jesus is just cold. He said, have you not read about David when he was on the run? And the reason why he was on the run is because there was an illegitimate king called Saul. But David was the legitimate king. You had the illegitimate king on the throne, but you had the legitimate king on the run. Let me put it like this. The one who was on the run was in the right, but the one who was on the throne was in the wrong. <laughs> Just maybe, if I'm David, maybe y'all on Saul's side, maybe y'all on the wrong side. Just, but, but, but let's be here for another day. Have you not read it? He was running away from those who wanted to kill him. Kind of like y'all gonna want to try to kill me, but we'll say that for another day. <laughs> hey, hey, have you not, everybody say, have you not read? Oh my God. And then he says, look at the text where he said, what happened is he can't get no food and he got a posse. Kind of just like I got a posse. He called him the king's men, David's men. I call my disciples. But they were hungry. Kind of like we hungry. We ain't got no gravy. <laughs> we ain't got no beef steak. We ain't got nothing up in here except this bread of presence. Now, here's the problem with the bread of presence the bread of presence is only for the priest. So, by law, David and his men ain't supposed to touch it. But he said, Do y'all remember that an exception was made for David? Because although the law said that, it wasn't that David was trying to break the law. The issue was that the law didn't apply in this particular situation because David was under unusual conditions. He was on his way to becoming the king. He was being chased by some, everybody say, unusual conditions. And under these unusual conditions, God allowed 
about me. When David said, the Lord is my light, I'm the one who said, I am the light. When David said, bless the Lord, I'm the Lord that he was blessed. If you remember that David slew the giant and cut off the head of the giant, but I'm going to go to the cross and cut off the head of the serpent. If you remember that David asked for forgiveness, but I'm the one who gives forgiveness. You remember David? Yeah, he made a sacrifice for the nation, but I am the sacrifice for the nation. I'm the son of the Lord of the Sabbath. So if you can make a pass for him, surely you can make a pass for the Lord of the Sabbath. What does it mean that he's the Lord of the Sabbath? Let me tell you when it comes. He said, well, here's the thing. Since I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, that means that I designed it. the world. 
Why have y'all lied on him? <laughs> yeah, man, man, what's up with y'all? You know you can pray the Lord's prayer and not be in relationship with the Lord of the prayer and not know our Father. All I'm saying is you can be involved in the things of God and totally miss out on Him. He said, don't get it twisted. Don't get so down in your rules and your regulations and your rituals and all of that and forget that I'm the greater David, that I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, that I'm the center of the celebration. That's why I like that song that, uh, what's his name? Richard Smallwood sings. He said, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. He said, you're the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. So he says, Jesus, number one, values his rights over our regulations. Look at somebody say, keep the main thing the main thing. Uh-huh. And see, you can get so caught up, let me just go and sing this next little footnote. You can get so caught up. And oh, I can't wait to get back to Sunday. And oh, I can't wait to get back to church. And, oh, look at the purple. And, oh, look at the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and just so caught up in the Sunday. Ain't nothing wrong. Thank God that we got a chance to do it. I'm just saying. You can get so caught up in that that worship for you only becomes a weekend experience. <laughs> But I wrote something out and I want to see it like I wrote it out. Can I write, can I read it like I wrote it? Just in case y'all don't want to say amen. I'm going to just read it, okay? God does not want to be your weekend getaway. He wants to be your eternal home. And can I read it again like I wrote it? God does not want to be your weekend getaway. But he wants to be your eternal home. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I designed it. I defined it. I direct it. And I take it to his destination, which is true rest, which is true return, which is true release. And it is to bring you back in working condition so you can serve the purpose for which I created you. Am I saying something? If I ain't, I'm, I'm really trying. I'm really trying. Now, Jesus values his rights over our regulation. And the same thing I want to say, which is the last thing is this. Jesus values his restoration over our restrictions. So we switch scenes. And anytime you read it from now on, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, they're meant, they're two different occasions, but they're meant to be read together. How do I know that? Look at verse 6. On another Sabbath day. So in his mind, Luke is like, remember what I just told you? So connect the two. The thing that the similarity in both of them is, both of them are dealing with this Sabbath thing. Remember, Sabbath is a big thing. Remember, Sabbath uh, is our natural identity. Sabbath, we sit around that Sabbath. You break a death penalty, Sabbath, rest, relaxation, return, release. Sabbath is huge. If we lose Sabbath, we lose who we are. So he said, now on another Sabbath, Jesus now is dealing with the issue of restoration. You have a man with a withered hand here. And by the way, let me connect it a little bit better than that. The first one, remember Jesus just said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. That was a declaration. In this passage, he's about to give a demonstration. By healing this man, I'm going to show you on the Sabbath that I got the power. The power that I declared in the first passage, I'm about to demonstrate. Y'all, you know that God can bag up what he's saying. You know he got a way of doing that. When you say y'all sins be forgiven me. Oh, y'all don't believe me? Rise up and walk. Yeah, yeah. I'm the light of the world. Oh, y'all don't believe me? Blind man, open up your eyes. <laughs> you know he got the power to demonstrate what he declares, don't you? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm enjoying this all by myself this morning, but I'm trying to tell you, this text is telling you, here's a man who had a withered hand going to a situation, imagine a situation there in the synagogue, he's in the middle of teaching, and Jesus now wants to use this man as an illustration and demonstration of who he is, the thing is centered around me. And imagine, here's the rhythm hand, and the text is going to say that they're spying on Jesus. Verse 7, and 
the scribes and the Pharisees watched him. That's intent investigation for accusation, for condemnation, for assassination. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. Remember I told you earlier, everybody who's coming to church ain't coming for Christ. And some folks ain't coming to see, find him. They're trying to find you and look out. And they're coming to examine Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but although they're coming to examine him, they're the one going to get exposed. <laughs> they're coming to examine Jesus. You can appreciate this. I want you to kind of a little bit more enter into the situation of the Pharisee and the scribe who was coming for the wrong reason, having the wrong cause. The reason why they're crazy about the law, the reason why they are passionate about the regulations, is not because they're so into God. Because if they were into God, they would have been into Jesus. So this thing about everybody that holler about doing right ain't right. Pharisees and scribes are talking about doing right. They kind of by the wrong and all that kind of stuff. So why? So why are you interested in the law? The reason why we're interested in the law and our traditions is because whoever owns the rules controls the game. Did you hear what I said? I said whoever controls the rules. All right, owns the rules, controls the game. So the reason why I want to be over the regulation and I want to be over the rules is because if I can do that, I keep my place of power. I can always keep people in check and I have the ability to keep myself up and keep other folk down. You see this, so that's why they hate on Jesus. Uh, it's kind of like it's your job. And when people come and shout and tell me and celebrate that they have got the job or they got a promotion on the job, I sit them down. I even told my wife this one time. The promotion on the job, sit down and say, okay, now let me tell you what's about to happen. What's about to happen is you're about to catch hell. Huh? Well, let me tell you why. Because when you got the position that somebody that feel like they should have got. They should have, they were entitled to it. They get longer than longer than you. They got more connections than you do. They feel like whatever, for whatever reason, that's somebody who feel like you should have got the position. Now look at my wife. Look, y'all look at my wife. They should not here like you agree with me today. Okay, now look at me. I told my wife, I said, baby, be careful, Pep. What's going to happen is you got some folk in the wing, and what they going to do, they ain't going to. If they're that crazy. Now some people just, just they got no social intelligence. <laughs> and they're coming to you, I'm gonna cut your throat, I'm gonna do it right in your face. <laughs> but most folks who got a little a, a modicum of sense. Got sense enough to know that you just can't come and show your hand like that. But their goal becomes now, I'm gonna do everything I can, I'm gonna watch everything they do. I'm gonna listen to everything they say. I'm going to find out what the rules are down to the point so that I can discredit them to make the point y'all should have never got her in the first place. I'm the one. Look at somebody say, what would happen? That's a fallacy for you. That's a scribe for you. They got, they hate on Jesus because Jesus now is rising in popularity. He's rising in fame. He's rising in persuasion. And now as he's rising up, People are gathering to him. They don't like it. Wait a minute. We the ones been here. We the ones keep the law. We the ones that's controlling this thing. And the more they go over to him, that's the less folk that we are in control of. So they watch him. They listen to him. They look at the law. Not because I'm crazy about the law, but I'm trying to use God's word to attack somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. By the way, just let me say this in passing. Don't use the Bible mm. to beat people. Mm. Some of y'all need to rank, rank a word. This one, that, was, that was my rank a word. <laughs> Don't use the Bible to beat people. Mm -mm, we, I ain't saying this by myself today. Y'all ain't gonna go ahead and call pastor say we're gonna say we say it. So all together now, repeat after me. Don't use the Bible. Don't use the Bible. Using the word and trying to beat the word with the word. Wow, figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> the man is here, they're watching him with a withered hand. He comes up, and Jesus said, Come on. 
and he brings him front and center. Imagine a withered hand. With his hand, he cannot eat. With his hand, he cannot work. With his hand, he cannot lift up his belongings. He cannot lift up a fellow human being. With his hand, he cannot contribute to society. With his hand, he cannot embrace his wife and his children and his grandchildren. With his hand, it's withered, disabled, out of commission, not in good working condition. With this hand, he can't do nothing. And what Jesus wants to do is take this which is out of good working condition, that is out of order, put it back in circulation so he can use the hand to serve him. Did, did you hear what I said? With this hand that's out of commission, that's disabled, that is not in good working condition, I want to take this hand. So he brings up the man in the hand. And please understand, you do know that when Jesus started healing the people, all right, it ain't just about the physical healing. He's making a spiritual point. Like when he healed a man with the leper, it wasn't just about his physical defilement, but I got the power to heal your spiritual defilement. When he took the man who was a paralytic and raised him up, not only do I have the power to raise you up, but I got the power to forgive your sin. When he healed the man who was blind, not only am I the power to forgive you physical sight, but give you spiritual insight. So here, when Jesus does a physical miracle, he's making a spiritual point. So in essence, Jesus said, look, this is going to help me with my teaching. When I see this man's withered hand, it reminds me of this withered world. Because this world is in the same condition that this man's hand is in. Out of all. Not in good working condition. Not in its rightful place. Has been separated from the purpose for which it has been created. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on this with a hand and what I can do with this hand, I can do with your life. Turns around and the text said that Jesus started looking at them as if to say, okay, y'all been looking at me. Let me turn around and look at y'all. <laughs> because y'all ain't here to judge me. I judge y'all. I'm not judged based on y'all standards. Y'all judge based on my standard. He looked at them and said, let me ask y'all a question. Since y'all gonna talk about what's lawful. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Matter of fact, let's read it like it is. And Jesus said, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? Uh -huh. To save life or destroy it? Yeah. And then after looking around, he tells the man to stretch out his hand. Appreciate the question. To do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? You can see one of the Pharisees raising their hand and saying, sir, I see what you're saying. And we do as Sabbath keepers, we do allow in 911 situations on Sabbath, we do allow you to help somebody. So if you can't breathe, we give you mouth to mouth. If you are in an emergency situation and your bone is broken, we'll help you out. But teacher, I don't see how this applies because this man is not in a life-threatening situation. You can his hand on any other day. I mean, the dude been going around this long. He didn't wait one more day. <laughs> do it on Sunday. Do it on. You got all these other days. You got all this stuff in the calendar. You just want to do it today. <laughs> this is not a life-threatening situation. So why do you want to do it today? Let me respond to that by telling you that Jesus is basically doing it on Sabbath. Yeah. As if to say, not only is it allowed for me to do it on Saturday? But it's 
what I want to do. What I want to do with your life. Am I making sense? By the way, I want to say something else about this. Appreciate that God is addressing a spiritual issue by dealing with the physical issue. Let me say, because a lot of times we disconnect. Jesus is concerned about eternal life, but he's also concerned about immediate life. He's not just concerned with your permanent life in, in glory. He's also concerned with your present life right now. So he heals the man's immediate situation to let you know that the way I'm going to show you that I care about your eternal life is by caring about your life right now. Right. By the way, you do know that we serve a God who is pro-life. Yes. We have a pro-life God and we have a pro-life gospel. Yes. Let me say that again. And I didn't, I didn't say we had a Republican God. Right. He does not ride the back so the elephants are jackasses. He's the Lord. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But he's a pro-life God. And it's a pro-life gospel. Every time God gives a word, it's to invest in life, not to take away from life. So he said, any room that you got that's robbing people of their life, it is against me because I'm here to save and I'm going to break your rules in order to fix broken lives. Because lost lives matter, and wounded lives matter, and broken lives matter. And one of the best ways that you can share the gospel about Jesus being concerned about folks' eternal life is caring about their present life. Now, let me make that plain. What I'm saying is, why would people be convinced that you're concerned with how they live for eternity? Well, you ain't even concerned about how they live right now in prison. A little bit will show you what a lot's going to be like. So maybe instead of me just waiting to be able to say, Jesus, I've been seeing you a sinner, and we're saved by grace, faith, and listen to that else, we're going to be just fine, I'm going to be saved, one day, I'm going to take it to heaven. Maybe instead of just waiting for that time to come, can I help you with your groceries? I care about your present life. It's cold outside. You ain't got no heat in the house. Maybe we can call and make you some accommodation so you can get somewhere so you can get warm. I care about your present life. Uh, we got Corona out here. And I don't want to put you at risk, so maybe I'm going to put a mask on. And, and, uh, and check it with his feelings. Yeah. <laughs> he listened to God. 
God's word. And he listened to what God said more than what he had seen. Stretch out. Why I can't do it. He stretched out. And can I tell you what he said? He said it was restored. The word restored, that means he found strength. Let me put it like this. He found strength as he stretched. Walk out to decide to kill him. You got out free. 
But it cost Jesus everything.
If you don't get to know him, right now, today, just come on. Right where you are, you don't have to stand up. We extend two invitations to you. This Jesus that I'm talking about who broke the rules, he doesn't just break rules because he do not have no standards. He's breaking whatever rules that stand in the way of him getting to you to turn your life around and fix you. And he broke all the rules when he got on the cross. And everything that was expected and everything was written, he said, forget all that. Because the law, if the law could have fixed you, y'all had 1,400 years with the law. And it didn't do nothing for you. So I'm going to have to do something outside of the rules. And give you some grace and mercy. And do whatever it takes in order to gain and maintain the relationship. That's what the cross is about. The cross ain't about duty so as much as it is about I'm going beyond what I got to do. In order to do, to step in your life and give you what you need. So Jesus comes for God so love the world. That he gave his only son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish. Thank you. 